Every hard event, hard training session, what motivates me to get through it is I always pause before I start whatever it is and think back to all of the children that are sitting in the hospital beds right now and how they would love to be anywhere else and be doing anything besides sitting in the hospital bed. And I know that because I was one of them. And when I was laying there on my literal deathbed, I started making a list of things that uh, I always wanted to do in my life. The next time I'm in that literal deathbed, I won't have that anger and I won't have those regrets because I'm using my time now to do everything that I want to do. The crossing for cystic fibrosis is one of the most challenging endurance events in the world, both physically and mentally, because you're paddling 80 miles across the ocean. Imagine starting at Bimini in the Bahamas at midnight and attempting to paddle 12 to 18 hours across the treacherous Gulf Stream to the Florida mainland. The idea of the crossing was born after my daughter Piper was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis and I was inspired to learn about the incredible health benefits of the ocean for those living with cystic fibrosis. It may sound crazy, but when you remember why you're doing it, for the people with cystic fibrosis who battle day in and day out with this genetic life-threatening disease, it makes every second on that board worth it. When you really think about it, considering how challenging this crossing can be, the fact that Scott Johnson is paddling with somebody else's lungs is really mind blowing. So I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis when I was three months of age, um, you know, much earlier than I can remember back to. At that time, the average childhood of someone with CF was two years of age, and that's best case scenario. It was crushing. As a parent, you never want to hear that about your child. But it's through medication and medical advances in cystic fibrosis at the time that, you know, helped carry me through I had a fairly normal childhood. There was some discrimination that I faced when I was a kid because, you know, I was a skinny kid that coughed a lot back in the early 70s and, you know, a lot of the parents didn't realize that it was a genetic disease and you had to be born with it. They just didn't want their children playing with me because they were afraid that their children were going to catch what I had. Most people don't realize that individuals with cystic fibrosis have to have treatments every day. Oral medications, uh, aerosols, and some sort of clapping or vibration on their upper torso. When I was younger, cystic fibrosis didn't really affect my activity or my energy level. Um, I was a very active child. I would be what you would call a hyper child nowadays. <laughs> I encouraged him to try everything that he wanted to try. As a child, Scott tried organized sports. He tried several and failed at them because of his cystic fibrosis. He just didn't have the lung capacity and that didn't stop him. He would try something else. 
and he kept going until he found something he loved. Some of my earliest memories are, are being at the beach and building sandcastles with my brother. I don't remember a time in my life when the beach wasn't there. It's, it's always been there. My relationship with the ocean progressed through my childhood, but it wasn't until I was 13 years old that I would consider myself starting to surf. And that was something he could do, a sport that he could excel at. It's been a love-hate relationship ever since then. That first moment that you stand up on the board and actually ride the wave, that is, it's golden. You know, it, it, you'll never stop, I don't think. And, and having fun at the beach, that was just an added bonus. I didn't know at the time that it was actually helping save my life, literally. Saline vapor was an early part of the treatment for Scott to loosen up the mucus in his lungs and help him clear them naturally. The ocean air is just another form of that saline vapor. As I got older, that's when CF, the lung part of it, started to rear its ugly head. When I was 29 years old, I just wasn't feeling well. I couldn't walk 10 feet without coughing and stopping to catch my breath. And I just went to a medac. They realized at that time that my blood saturation of oxygen was at 84%. I had bacterial pneumonia that had been there for a while undiagnosed and it had shredded my lungs. They were completely bad. And that was kind of the, the start of the downward spiral. I went into the hospital. When I first saw him in the hospital bed, it was such a shock. He had lost so much weight. He was down to 97 pounds, gaunt looking, bound to the hospital bed. He was too weak to walk even just devastating to see your child in that condition. My doctor, as kindly as he could say, was basically telling me, you're either gonna get a lung transplant and walk out of here, or you're not leaving. For someone who's 29 years of age, that's a very hard pill to swallow. And it was at that point that I realized, oh yeah, you know, this is probably going to kill me. At the rate that I'm declining right now, it's probably going to happen very soon. And that was the point where, again, I faced my mortality and realized, you know, your clock is winding down and it's going to be weeks or months, not years. It was a very dark time. It, uh, it got to the point where I was contemplating suicide. I was, uh, I was hoarding medication that I knew was going to take me out. You know, cystic fibrosis had ruled my life up to that point. And um, I wasn't gonna let it take me out. No, it was gonna be on my terms, not cystic fibrosis terms. When I was laying there on my literal deathbed, I had a lot of regrets. I had a lot of anger. The fortunate thing that came out of that was one night I was, you know, sitting there and, and just trying to get through to another day. I started making a list of things that uh, I always wanted to do in my life. I made a promise to myself that if I got through this, and actually, you know, by some miracle, I had a lung transplant, that I would go through that list and check things off. 
Right around this time was when September 11th happened. Lungs did become available for me on September 11th, but because of the nationwide flying ban, the doctors couldn't fly out to get them. Luckily, four days later, a different set of lungs became available. Uh, the doctors flew out to get them, and they said that they were the healthiest, pinkest lungs that they had ever seen that they were going to transplant into my body. You know, there are a lot of challenges associated with lung transplantation that are more than, for example, kidney transplantation. You know, when you're taking the lung, you're taking a lung out, and then you put a new lung in. And once you get done putting it in, and you inflate it with air, it's a beautiful thing. You know, it pinks up and it, you know, it looks like a normal healthy lung and it's such a contrast to what you took out. When I woke up afterwards, it was kind of, it, it was disorienting. You know, it was kind of like waking up from a dream, you know, that you didn't know was going on. And they were taking the breathing tube out of my lungs, basically. And that first breath was the most quiet, incredible experience that I've ever had in my life. You know, it, I couldn't believe that I was actually breathing. This is how it's supposed to be. If I had died after that first breath, it would have been worth it to me. There's a risk of mortality after your lung transplant. It's not like you just live happily ever after. You've got to maintain that balance and it doesn't always work out. So once everything seemed to be going well, my physical therapy started. My road to recovery was a little different because I had been completely bedridden for two months. You know, I always make the analogy it's like training for the Olympics, you know, and that's just to be able to get up and to walk and to function. You gotta fight your way back. Gradually, they kept getting me out of bed and walking, and luckily I had a physical therapist named Calvin who is as crazy as I was about, you know, getting up and getting out. I still remember one day I was walking on the treadmill and I think Calvin came up to me and he said, okay, you, you're done, you can stop. And I was like, let me, five more minutes, 10 more minutes. He asked me point blank, he said, why are you pushing yourself so much? He said, I get driven people in here, said, but you're kind of taking it to the next level. And I looked at him and I remembered the list that I had made when I was in the hospital. And I told him, I said, you know, someday I'd like to do a triathlon. And coming from somebody who could barely walk, that's a pretty profound statement. And I think a lot of people would just laugh that off. And Calvin kind of was quiet for a minute and he looked me dead in the eye and he said, well, let's get you started. Swim for 2.4 miles, bike for another 112, then run a marathon. And if you cross the finish line, you'll hear the words, you are an Iron Man. With every breath Scott Johnson takes, he is an Ironman, even if he doesn't finish the race. It naturally, the progression was, you could do longer, you challenge yourself, you keep going, you, you push the lungs that you've gotten to the absolute limit because it was a gift that you don't want to waste. Scott's lifestyle was, well, it was kind of more than what I was used to because he was training for the Ironman. The ability of even the most robust and trained elite athletes to do an Ironman, right? Um, you know, let alone to have someone who's a double lung transplant with cystic fibrosis, wow. Out of the seven Ironman races that I attempted, I only finished one. I know that I was the first double lung transplant to race and complete a full Ironman distance. Getting to the start line, to me, is a victory in and of itself. After meeting Scott, I started getting into, because of Scott, marathons, triathlon, half Ironmans, 
Ironmans. So that became kind of our lifestyle. And we took up paddle boarding in 2013. So we started leaving notes for each other on the counter over the years, and uh, I tended to notice a trend that the notes were always the same. So I took my great artistic ability and came up with these cards. Um, I think the stick figures are perfect. 99.9% .9 of the time, that's what we're doing in the morning. I haven't had the opportunity really to worry about Scott. He's had a really um, unremarkable path after his transplant thus far and has remained, you know, the healthiest that he could be. I mean, he still takes a lot of medications that probably most people to even look at him wouldn't realize just how many pills may be in his pocket. So this is my basket of pills for my medications that I have to take every day after my uh, double lung transplant. 38 pills, one shot, two inhalers um, every day. This is it. One of the more defining characteristics about Scott is that he does do things that are a little bit, I, I'm going to say even off the wall. He comes up with these crazy things that he wants to do or learn next. Ukulele has been one of them. So Scott just likes to have fun. <laughs> you are a handful, buddy. You are a handful. This is where the Carolina Cup took place a couple years ago, where Scott and I met. We were introduced and started telling his story about his, his transplant and his path with cystic fibrosis. And it dawned on me right then and there that everything that we had put into creating the crossing for CF, Piper's Angels Foundation. He was the epitome of what I hoped for, for Piper to be able to look up to. Tonight, I'm really honored and grateful and excited to invite up a gentleman who has become a close friend who I met a couple years ago at the Carolina Cup in, North, in uh, North Carolina. He's one of the most inspiring and humbling guys that I've ever been around. And I'm so excited uh, for him to come up and share about his journey. So, Mr. Scott Johnson, would you please come up? You know, I talked to him about it late last year, early this year, and I said, you know, I'm doing it. It's a 20 year anniversary of my lung transplant. I was like, I've got to do it. You know, I have to do it. This event, to me, kind of comes back around to sum up what has been my life. It just makes sense to me, total sense. As Scott and I started talking about doing the crossing, uh, we thought it would be really cool to do it as a four-person relay team with one of his best friends, Scott, and his wife, Leanne. Usually in the past, the Iron Man, for example, was for him, but I believe this time it's more so for others with cystic fibrosis. You know, if you have struggled with life and death, taking on something like the crossing or other challenges you set for yourself, you know, you have a different perspective on that. One aspect of the crossing that a lot of people don't understand until they do it is that the finish line isn't for winners. This event is about community, commitment, and courage. So whether you do one mile, five miles, 50 miles in the open ocean, or you make it the whole way, it's really about getting out there and showing up. For the training for Scott, he, I've never seen him so inspired. He's getting up. The other morning he got up at 4.30 a.m. to go paddling. To me, if he's gonna get up at 4.30, it must mean something to him because it takes a lot to get Scott out of bed. So a lot of my training, of course, is focused around paddleboarding. boarding. 
Mixed in there is of course cross training with you know, a little bit of strength training, a little bit of uh, biking just to uh, change things up and so my body doesn't get injured. What makes the crossing such a difficult challenge from an athletic perspective is that you really need to show up as a total package. And what I mean by that is you need to be in great physical strength, you know, your cardio, your endurance, your strength, your flexibility. But more importantly, arguably, is your mental strength. Um, you need to mentally prepare for spending six hours paddling in the dark and then another eight to 12 hours, you know, paddling across that ocean to get back to Florida. The crossing is very different than almost any other endurance race or challenge in the world in that it doesn't matter how much you train because on so many levels, the ocean, which is our venue, is the X factor. The, the stuff that I'm nervous about, when it comes down to it, the weather, you have no control over that. Who knows what can happen, especially with the way the weather's been here in, in Bimini. You know, there's nothing we can really do about it except push forward. Crossing Crusaders! There's always a little bit of, you know, trepidation in everybody's eyes. You can, you can see the excitement and also the fear of the unknown, you know. We're paddling out around midnight into the ocean. What time did you guys call it? I, okay. Uh, I don't know what time it was, um, but we were like, we're just over 13 miles in, but everybody was feeling it. I mean, uh, Scott got seasick. I mean, the fumes, the fumes were blowing right off the motor into, into the boat. It wasn't for a lack of trying. <clears throat> it wasn't for a lack of training. We were all out there. We were having a good time. It just got to the point that, you know, it was dangerous. That's, you know, we live to, to paddle another day, I guess you could say. It, it really feels like unfinished, you know? It feels unresolved in your heart because you know you came out there to do a challenge that you didn't complete. While we are here on a beautiful beach in Bimini, in the Bahamas, enjoying this beautiful view, enjoying this beautiful community, with the capability, with the bodies, to be able to do something as tremendous as to look out across that ocean and dare to take the first stroke to get to the other side. How many people in the world wish that they could be standing here among you? How many can deepen into your hearts with your breath the compassion for all of those people right now who are laying in a hospital bed fighting for their life? Roses are a symbol of hope in the cystic fibrosis community. We're going to hold the roses up. We're going to hold them with love. And on the countdown of three, two, one, we're going to toss them high in the air.
came back this year because I realized that the crossing is just my kind of crazy. The challenge of the crossing itself, the hours and hours of training for it, and the people who are involved just made this such an epic event. I had to come back to do this again. This year I'm paddling solo instead of on a relay team, which means I'll be attempting the full 82 miles. You want to accomplish that challenge because you're taking it on. On the other hand, the fact that you're taking the challenge on is already a huge success. Ryan Burgess, lane one, Scott Johnson, lane two, Todd McLaughlin, lane three, Travis Sink. You know, because Scott was attempting it solo this year, it was really critical to surround him with strong paddlers who had a lot of crossing experience and great attitudes. I was super excited to be paddling with Scott again, then Todd jumped on board, and then Ryan, and it was really important that no matter how far each of us paddled, that we did it together as a team. They're on their way. What up? Yo, nothing. Pacing is so important in the crossing because this is a long distance endurance challenge, right? Our plan for the paddle was to average around a three mile an hour pace and that would keep us going slow enough but fast enough to get across. We also were adhering to a three minute break rule. So we were paddling for 57 minutes with a three minute break and then right back on the board. The three minute break is a very fast break. Okay. See me throw it in my mouth. <laughs> Toss it high, I'll catch it. Go, go high, arc it high. <laughs> Salty potatoes. I really try not to have too much expectation about the weather until we're literally out there, but nobody, I don't think, could have predicted how incredible it was. In 2018, we had a really calm year and we saw bioluminescence that year, but it was nothing like this year. I mean, you could hit your paddle on the water and it just like, looked like stars going off in the ocean. Woo! I would get this bright blue lights and it was just, it was magic, it was epic. And it was perfect for the setting of that night. Oh, magical. You know, Scott has a lot of considerations with his health and you know one of my concerns was how is Scott doing. It definitely was in my mind and awareness the entire time and so the first indicator that I really had that Scott something was going on was when he said that he was he was not feeling like he could go to the bathroom like to urinate to pee. That's a pretty strong indicator that something could be going a little sideways. I also started experiencing a little bit of stomach issue. Um, I'm not sure if it was seasickness or if I uh, over overdid the sugar at the very beginning. How you doing, Scott? Wait, can't keep anything down, so I'm just going to switch to water. Man, happens. As we neared sunrise, I knew how important this moment was to Scott, to be out there in the middle of the ocean, to see the sunrise. Yet at the same time, you know, he wasn't talking a lot. It was kind of a, an interesting uh, contrast, right, between what he was going through and also the, the feeling of being out there in this immense, beautiful seascape where there wasn't even a ripple on the ocean. You know, the, the board, right, was floating on a mirror with 2,000 feet underneath it. 
and to look around and not be able to distinguish between the the clouds and the light on the horizon and the ocean to not even be able to find the horizon you know, as a paddler that's a once in a lifetime opportunity I mean, my heart was just like volcanic joy. And, and also to know that every other paddler, every other captain and crew that was out there in the crossing fleet was also getting to experience it. So I was still feeling a little touchy, I guess you could say, with my stomach, but uh, the Captain John told me, he said, you know, it may seem counterintuitive, but you really need to eat something. I took his advice, even though I did not feel like eating anything at the time, and uh, yeah, I, I came back from, from that. I started feeling a lot better. into a pot of dolphins. That was really, really cool. They were coming under the boat, coming around the boards. We could see them 40, 50 feet down. That's how calm the water was. There's, a, there's such a good feeling paddling out in the ocean when you have a dolphin next to you. You know, as the sun came up, it got unbelievably hot. The reflection of the sunlight off the water and the fact that the water was so sheet glass calm started to feel like we were paddling on top of like tin foil. Captain started to look at the charts and how far we had gone and how far we had to go. There was a break and a determination made that because the ocean was so calm and so still and we didn't have any wind, it was taking a lot longer to get across and you've got to finish the crossing within an 18 hour window. And so there was some concern that we weren't going to make it. Gulfstream was moving unusually slow, it typically moves somewhere between five to eight miles an hour. He said, I think the Gulfstream is actually traveling about three and a half miles an hour, three to four. If we want to make it within the 18 hour cutoff, we're going to need to bump it from 3.5 to a seven mile an hour pace which was gonna double the speed that we needed to paddle because at that point we were already feeling the intensity of that many hours that we had been going. Uh, we had not even reached the halfway mark at that point. To push harder at that point was really impossible to some degree. Yeah. So I tell people that I'm built more like a diesel engine. Um, if you start me up at a slow pace, I can go all day long. But as soon as you enter speed or anything like that in there, I just fall apart. It lasted, I believe, for about an hour, 15 minutes before, you know, the lack of nutrition for a little while. I still wasn't feeling 100%, and it was, it was just too much for me. The coolest spots at the front. He just physically was gassed and exhausted, uh, which was over 40 miles into the, the crossing. For Scott, the most important thing was his health and his safety. So what he did was incredible with a double lung transplant and battling through the physical condition that he was in at that point. You have to be realistic about things. If you're pushing the envelope, you have to also recognize if you're pushing too far. Uh, I don't want to stop. I just want to hold on to say I do. Support.
So I was up the front of the boat and Scott had come up to me and just said, hey Todd, you ready to paddle up onto the beach? If you start this event together, you should finish it together. You know, after what those guys had gone through, what Todd and Scott had been through, what we'd all been through together that day, uh, to see them get back in the water and to come together and, and finish together, it was one of the most memorable and most important moments in my life. It doesn't matter whether you do five miles or the full 80. It's what you bring to the table. It's about the journey in itself. The journey that we went through from that point to the moment of stepping feet on the sand, I can't put into words. It was so powerful. It was a life-changing experience. You know, with the total amount of mileage that I got is actually double what I would have done last year with the uh, relay team. So 40, 41 miles is, is actually the furthest I've ever paddled in my life. I am very proud and, and happy with the accomplishment that I did yesterday. The crossing, what happened this year, kind of parallels what happens in my life a lot of times and in most everyone's life, I think. You know, you, you set a goal, you strive to achieve that goal, you do everything that you can to, to reach that goal. And sometimes you make it, sometimes you go beyond, and sometimes you don't get there. But the most important thing is you have to put yourself out there and try to do these things to make your life more fulfilling and, and enrich it and enrich other people's lives in the process. I'm so incredibly grateful to Scott for his example for Piper and for the cystic fibrosis community and for all of us to inspire us um, beyond what most of us could ever imagine living or surviving through. Since his transplant, he's had one goal, to get the message out that you can not only survive cystic fibrosis or adversity of any kind, you can thrive. And it's not a matter of being unrealistic about things. There are a lot of stark realities of limitations and things that you can't do. But there's also this thing of, I'm going to, I'm going to live as full as I can live. Too many people nowadays are living on cruise control and by the time that they realize that they really have a short amount of time on this earth, it's too late to do some of the things that, that they have dreamt about doing or thought about doing and uh, trying to reach goals or dreams that they have in their life. No matter how crazy they think they are, they should go for it. After my transplant, it was very hard for me to realize and, and come to terms with the facts that in order for me to live, someone else had to pass away. And it still breaks me up to this day. But I'm extremely, extremely thankful that that person was an organ donor. This was what I feel now was my purpose for coming through what I went through, was to tell my story and try to inspire people. And, you know, I'm just an ordinary, everyday guy. I've just had an extraordinary life. So this is, this is my first surfboard. It's a Linden uh, surfboard out of California. <laughs> Where'd you get some pieces? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> that so, was the one that made your mom know you were, <laughs> you were turning into he's, a bum. He's gonna, be, he's gonna be a little different, yeah. yeah. This is Tyrone and Bella. 
They are 14 years old. You just do the documentary on Tyrone. That's what you need to do, like a sub documentary. You know how people create Facebook pages for their, their dogs and cats? Oh, oh my gosh. We're gonna get calls from PETA. I <laughs> That face though. Tyrone, are you happy? No, go ahead. Just walk, walk normal. You don't have to splash. It's not a big deal. You know, splash but don't splash too much, you know what I mean? <laughs> Take it all in. Yeah, let it all out. Yeah, they're here. <laughs> Put some gravy train dog food down. It's tough. You lie in bed and not wondering if you're enough. Well, trust me now when I say you are. But no matter what this life at times will break you apart So if your world gets heavy and your fire burns low Your road gets rough and your heart runs cold Just let it be like the wind through the trees Let it flow with ease like an ocean breeze Take it all in Let it all Let it all out. So if your day gets crazy, don't think there's nothing that you can do. Yeah, when your day gets crazy.